be looking at John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18 uh, this morning. Uh, this is God's word, eternally true. Verse 11, I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have, spoke, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Here ends our reading. Uh, there's a response of thankfulness that's printed for you in your bulletin, and it's up on the screen here as well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. I watched a number of years ago a show that was put out by the History Channel. I watched it on Amazon Prime or whatever they call that, Prime Movie, Prime Video. What do they call that now? Yeah, Prime Video. And it was uh, a series called uh, Vikings. And, and I enjoyed it greatly. It was uh, more it was very violent, if you like violent stuff, then great. If you don't, you may have some places to cover your eyes uh, there. But it was, it was uh, fascinating looking at Vikings around 800, 900, uh, AD 800, AD 900. And, and one of the, the hardest scenes for me to take was when uh, the main protagonist, that kind of the whole five or six seasons surrounds is, is Ragnar Lothbrok. And uh, Ragnar finally comes to his own death. And if you want to watch the series, plug your ears at this point, spoiler alert, um, his enemies capture him and they throw him down into a pit of vipers. <laughs> That'd be, we were talking at my family dinner table about the worst kind of death you could have. We were saying, you know, drowning or fire and I don't know, Pit of Vipers is pretty tough um, there. Uh, but we, we see that a couple of times here in, in this passage. But, but really, Ragnar has done great destruction. As much as, you know, I, I liked the Vikings as a kid, as my favorite football team in the NFL, loved the helmets, and, you know, was just thrilled by, you know, the, the Vikings and all that. I still like them, by the way, Minnesota gal back there. Um, but... Uh, uh, that they did so much destruction. They just went and stole and killed people and stole their stuff. That's what Vikings did. They're from all Scandinavia, you know, Sweden and, and Norway and, and, and uh, um, Finland, that, that whole area up there, Denmark. Um, and, uh, but when Ragnar gets bitten by all these poisonous snakes in the end, he deserves it. As much as I admired him, and just he was just you know such a hero of a guy, uh, as as you're watching the as you're watching the show, he really deserved it. How how many people had he killed? How much destruction? And he just went and stole people's stuff. Other people worked for this stuff, and he just went and and stole it. Um, but as we see um, uh, ourselves, and as we see Jesus speaking here, as we see God through Moses speaking in Numbers 21. We have to come to something that Scripture squarely puts to us. We deserve much worse than we receive. Uh, as we saw in our declaration of the gospel, the central, uh, the central verse in that, you can uh, look at it there um, the, in the very middle, Psalm 103.10. David writes, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Uh, and, and that's that's how we stand today. We have a Lord who does not pay us uh, back according to our iniquities. And, and so Jesus talks about in this light of what we deserve as people. Uh, people have been created by Jesus himself, as John uh, recounts for us in 
chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 and 14. There, Jesus has created us. He, he sustains us. And yet, we don't think of him too much. Even devout Christians aren't thinking of Jesus and, 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 and walking in sinless perfection all the time. And we say sinless perfection not as a pejorative. Well, of course I can't walk in sinful perfection. We really ought to. Um, that's what we owe God. To walk in his way all the time for his glory. But we don't. And so Jesus talks to us now about a way out. How it is that we might not be treated as our, our sins deserve. Um, so if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that as we go along. If you want to just listen, that's fine too. However best, best you take it in is fine by me. But God says to us first in this passage, number one, Jesus protects. Jesus protects and sustains everyone. Jesus protects and sustains everyone generally and actively. He sustains and protects everyone uh, generally and actively. Um, so in verse 16 there, you see in the very, maybe the most famous verse in all of Scripture, at least today, John 3, 16, um, he uses this word perish, doesn't he? He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. That's the expectation. That's where everyone is, is going, to perish. Um, so we perish apart from Jesus. Um, Numbers 21.6, we kind of see that with modern day eyes that say man is born innocent and just corrupted by society, which logically makes no sense, right? If we're all born innocent, where does corruption come from? Uh, and, and scripture says the opposite. In sin, we were conceived. Um, and, and so we, we sin because we're sinners, okay? We, we don't become sinners by sinning. We're, our, we, we're sinners from the start. We are, our our uh, proclivity is to do, to do wrong, to do what's selfish. That's what Seinfeld's about, right? <laughs> it's, it's doing what we want and what's selfish without being seen or looking too bad. Um, but, but we look at Numbers 21, and, and, and we see verse 6 there, and, and God sends out the serpents. He sends out the venomous snakes. And, and we might tend to accuse God like the people had been doing in that instance there. They accuse God of not being good to them. What's he done for us? He only delivered us from slavery and gives us food every day. <laughs> and they're complaining. Um, and, and, but, you know, they're in the wilderness. And you know what's in the wilderness? Venomous snakes and scorpions. And he's been protecting them from this all the while. Um, he recounts this to them at the end of their 40 years in the wilderness and says, I gave you bread to eat. I protected you this whole time. Look at your sandals. They didn't even wear out after 40 years. Anyone have running shoes that last more than 40 years? <laughs> so God's been actively sustaining them, actively protecting them. And that's what he's been doing for his people in Numbers 21. He's pre been preventing venomous snakes and says, it says, okay, you think I don't have anything to do with your well-being here in the wilderness all these years so far? Okay, I'll remove my protection and let's just see what happens. And the venomous snakes come in. Uh, but beyond this, um, Colossians 1.17 speaks of of Jesus holding all things together. You know, I was amazed by this. I was actually a young Christian at the time, I think. Um, maybe I learned it a little bit earlier, but how, how in the world does a nucleus stay together? You know, in chemistry? You know, positives and negatives attract, so positive attracts the... But in the nucleus of an atom, you've got all these protons together, positive charges together. And yet Colossians 1.17 says, Jesus holds all things together. Very similar thing said in Hebrews 1.3 as well. Uh, but we looked at a couple of passages. If you 
uh, remember what you heard from uh, Jim uh, speaking from Psalm, uh, Job 34, 14. Listen to this, how God sustains us, how God is actively sustaining all things, all plants. Um, why isn't entropy happening um, in certain instances? Why is a plant growing and becoming more complex from the time it's a seed? Um, why, why did you become more complex from the time you were a zygote and planted in the womb of your mother? Why did you develop things like fingernails and eyelashes and that kind of thing? How do those things come together? When I throw an egg out into the street, it doesn't turn into eyelashes and, and fingers that are functional, that can pick up things. That's what entropy would predict. That's what randomness, evolution would predict. Yet Jesus is holding all things together, doing the opposite of entropy, showing forth his, his glory. Uh, but Job 13, 34, 14 says this, if it were his intention of God's intention and he withdrew his spirit and breath. Okay, that's a reference to Adam, right? Adam's clay that's formed and God gives him his spirit and, and Adam's animated and begins to, to grow and, and to be who he is and speak. If it were his intention and he withdrew his spirit and breath, all mankind would perish together and man would return to the dust. This is our understanding. God keeps us together. Apart from him, we just perish and we become like that egg thrown out into the street, evaporating here and there and, and eventually not being recognizable as an egg. Um, Isaiah 40, 26 Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created these? This is your call to worship this morning. You can look there and see that. Who created these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The stars are there together, producing their light not missing, suspended in space, as he talks in other places in Job, because he's holding them together. They're not missing because he's actively holding up the universe. So Jesus is, is uh, protecting and sustaining everyone generally and actively. This is believers and non-believers. No, he protects believers especially, he sustains us in special ways, but everyone this is true of. Um, Psalm 36, 6. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast, the psalmist says there. Hebrews 1, 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact represent, representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus in heaven is actively sustaining all things by his powerful word. He's keeping us. He's holding us together. This calls for gratefulness. Right? That's the logical response to this. I'm not blown up. Um, I don't uh, take off my socks and my feet explode and spray the walls. <laughs> Jesus is holding me together. Um, so no, A there in your outline, this is how unbelievers continue to live and sometimes prosper in earthly ways. This is how unbelievers continue to live and somehow prosper in great ways. This is the struggle of, of Job and, and of David and of Solomon as Solomon writes the, the Proverbs. Why do the wicked prosper, they ask? How can they even exist? And David answers it a little bit, as we saw there in the Psalms. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Jesus is sustaining the wicked and the good. Um, this is how unbelievers continue to live and sometimes prosper. Um, Ecclesiastes 8.14, Solomon deals with this. He says there's something else meaningless that occurs on earth 
the righteous who get what the wicked deserve, and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. This is Solomon just summing up how life is. Um, God sustains the wicked during our lives. Um, he sustained Hitler. He sustained so Stalin and Mao. They weren't living apart from his sovereign uh, holding them together. This is what scripture call or what, what sorry, theology calls common grace. Common grace, that's a blank for you there. God is gracious to all. Um, he doesn't treat us as our, as our sins deserve. Um, B, right above that, that line there, God is currently being kind to the wicked and ungrateful. Those are the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 6, verse 35. God is kind. He's saying, you be kind. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For God is kind to the wicked and ungrateful. So you be like your God. Be kind to the wicked and ungrateful. Um, Luke 6.35 says that. Matthew 5.45 says, God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Paul said to the unbelievers in Lystra, which was a Gentile city in Acts 14, 17, yet God has not left himself without testimony. He has shown his kindness by giving rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. This is what Paul says to unbelievers, unbelieving Gentiles in the city of Lystra, where Timothy was from. Um, and, and so that's, that's common grace. God is kind to the wicked and ungrateful. He gives unbelievers food and to fill their bellies full. He gives them joy of certain times. Sometimes unbelievers' teams win. Um, sometimes their family's nice to them. And they enjoy their Christmas. And they're not believers. And God brings them that joy. He cares for his image, which is on each person, in other words. And he treats even unbelievers during this age not as their sins deserve. And see, here's a big reason why. Ready? See. This is also how you didn't perish before you believed in Jesus. If he had treated you as your sins deserved, you wouldn't have had time to come to faith. You would have perished before. And so we're in this era before Jesus returns where he is sustaining the wicked and ungrateful, which we were ungrateful to God for all he's done for us. Say, oh, God hasn't been good to me. Uh, wicked, doing what we wanted at the expense of others and, and, and not paying attention to what God had called us to do even though he created us and sustained us. But we didn't perish before believing in Jesus. And this is Jesus' answer in heaven to those who have died for their faith in Revelation 6, 11. John sees in this vision heaven and he sees Jesus on his throne. And he sees around Jesus' throne those who have been uh, 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 put to the sword for their faith. And they cry out to Jesus around his throne in heaven, and they say, How long, O Lord, till you, uh, till you avenge our blood? And Jesus' answer to them in Revelation 6, 11, is not until I gather up all your brothers. See what Jesus is doing that we see uh, him begin to do in, in uh, or that it, that we had seen him do in, in Revelation 6, 2, is that he's this rider on the white horse, given a crown, holding a bow, and going out as a conqueror bent on conquest. And Jesus today in this era is defeating sinful people like us. He's conquering the sinful natures of those the Father has been giving him, and he brings them to faith. All of you who have believed here were conquered by Jesus. 
Your sin nature was conquered. Your rebellion against God was conquered. Your resistance to saying, I need forgiveness from God because I deserve venomous snakes. Your resistance to that message was conquered by the rider on the white horse who has been given a crown, who rode out from heaven as a conqueror bent on conquest, on conquering your soul. Um, likewise, uh, Peter's dealing with, in Second Peter, a group of people uh, uh, th that were uh, teaching uh, falsehood to the churches of Turkey during his day. And in Second Peter, he begins to deal with one of the false teachings that um, were, were uh, present in these churches. And the false teaching was that Jesus was not coming back. And perhaps even that there was no final judgment. Uh, there was false teaching in Second Peter. As you read it, you see that there were teachers who were teaching that you could just be immoral and it didn't matter. And the second thing they were teaching was Jesus wasn't coming back. And Peter says in this context, answering the question, is Jesus coming back? He says, yep, looks like everything's today going on just the same as it always has. And so said the people during the days of Noah prior to the flood. And what happened to them? Wink, wink. And in the same way, the earth and the heaven will be consumed, but this time by fire, he says. And he says, and don't think just because it hasn't happened yet that it's not going to happen. For to the Lord, the day, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And he is patient with you, writing to the church, to those who aren't saved yet in the church. He's patient with you, not wanting any to perish but some to come to repentance. And so Jesus hasn't come today, and so you haven't perished because he is being wicked today, or sorry, he's being patient today and sustaining today and protecting today, today those who are wicked and ungrateful. So that's how you didn't perish before believing. So when you're tempted like me sometimes to curse the presence of those who are persecuting you for your faith, or causing you trouble because they're not, as, as Jim and I were riding along the road, they're turning right and not in the right turn lane <laughs> and going slow to turn right. Um, as we're tempted to curse and say, God, why don't you just get these dumb heads out of the way? Remember that you were one of those dumb heads. You were one of those sinners that God was patient with. And he sustained you while you were in your sins. Um, he protected you while you were in your sins so he could deliver the gospel to you in just the right way at just the right time so you could believe and so he could save you through your faith. Now, number two, number two. This general protection, this general protection and sustaining will be removed. This general sustaining and protection will be removed. Uh, again, verse 16 there are some who will perish. Jesus speaks in verse 18 in this passage that those who haven't believed have been condemned already and they will perish. Uh, there will come a time when people will perish. There will come a time that will be the equivalent of what we see in this foreshadowing of Numbers 21, the venomous snakes. When God, with, when God removes his protection, his protective wall, that's protecting all people and allowing them to live and that's giving them food in their bellies and joy in their hearts, he's going to remove that protection for them. He's going to remove his sustaining of them and just let, think, let them get what they deserve. So God provides a way, though, not to perish when his protection and provision are removed in the future. It's this, number three. It's this, number three. Look to the sun. Look to the sun. Capital S-O-N. Capital S-O-N. Look to the sun, Jesus, believing this action will save you. This is what Jesus is teaching here. Look to me, he says, for this action will save you, just like looking to that bronze serpent that Moses held up saved them. Look to the Son, Jesus, believing this action will save you. So A there, God has provided that belief in Jesus. God has provided, just like he provided Moses' people who were all complaining, snot-nosed brats, right? 
They would have been in slavery and they were saying slavery was better than being in God's care. That's what they're saying in this passage. Why, Moses, did you take us out of Egypt? Why, God, did you bother us? We don't like your protection. You, we don't like the way you're doing things. What they deserved was to perish, but God provided a way for them. He's gracious to them as they complain about him saving them. As they complain about him providing for them food every day in the midst of the desert. They're like, we don't like this food. He shows them grace. He shows them patience. He shows them love. And he provides for them in the desert there, Numbers 21, a way to survive, a way to be saved from this venomous, these venomous snakes, to which I would have said, oh, good. <laughs> don't, I don't like black snakes, and they're not poisonous, so venomous snakes are much worse. Um, so God showed this. Uh, uh, he provided that belief in Jesus would save you from what you deserve. That's your blank for your ungratefulness and sins. You know, if someone ever says to you, an unbeliever, uh, well, I've never sinned. Well, first of all, that's not true. Uh, but say, well, how grateful have you been to God? Scripture says that Jesus is sustaining you right now. Have you ever thanked him? Do you thank him once a day? And then, you know, that, that brings out the sin itself of being ungrateful. Uh, but God provides belief in Jesus will save you from what you deserve for your ungratefulness and sins. Uh, this is how God treats the believer not as his sins deserve for eternity. B, B, 3B. God showed this in Moses' day. He provides a way, um, gives this, has Moses uh, create a bronze serpent put up on a pole and this arbitrary thing. If you look at this bronze serpent up on this pole, you won't be bit. Or you'll survive your bite, actually, it says there. You'll, you'll, you'll survive the bite. Uh, it's this, uh, this arbitrary way. So C, Numbers 21 was a foreshadowing of how God would. Numbers 21 was a foreshadowing of how God would save some from death through Jesus. Not everyone's saved there. Some people get bit by venomous snakes and they die. But those who look, who just say, okay, sounds silly to me, right? Like Naaman. Right? Naaman has leprosy, and he's, he's told to, to wash seven times in the Jordan River, and it's muddy, and, and he finally has to be convinced to just do it. I know it sounds arbitrary, but just do it. It's what God's prophet has said to do. And then finally he says, oh, well, okay. We've got a children's video. The, the, one of Naaman's assistants says, you know, if he had asked you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? So why not just do this simple thing? But Naaman does it, just arbitrary thing. Just go wash seven times. Nothing magical about that, but just show faith. Whatever God says to do to be saved from your leprosy, do it. And so he does it, and he's saved. And here with Moses, just look at this bronze snake. It could, could have been anything. could have been a, a silver donkey, you know, on the, on, in a baseball mat. <laughs> Whatever. If God says look at it, just look at it. And, and, and you'll be saved and rescued. But um, Numbers 21 was a foreshadowing what God would, how God would save some through Jesus. And we see that in verses 14 and 15. Look there, for, verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may not survive a snake bite, but may have eternal life. So it's this, if you're in Sunday school, it's a pattern. Okay, it's this pattern of how God redeems us and just asks us to have simple faith. Whatever he tells us to have faith in, we have faith in. And so number one there, C1, Jesus, the Son of God, was lifted up. How was he lifted up? We don't know which specifically he's speaking of here, but we know he is lifted up at least in three ways. He was lifted up on the cross. That's your first blank. He was lifted up in his resurrection, lifted from death, lying down flat in a tomb, lifted up from that. And then he was lifted up in Acts chapter 1, in his ascension. So he's lifted up in, with his cross, 
uh, he was literally from earth and he's like a bronze serpent on a pole you know on that cross that's the the imagery we have there um and those who look to to jesus on that cross right as, as their means of salvation jesus dying for my sins is saved from their sins to live eternally but Jesus is lifted up on the cross in his resurrection and his, in his ascension. And then number two there. Uh, but one needs to look to believe, in other words, to believe in the lifted up Jesus to be saved from death. And you see in verses 15 and 16 and 18, this repetition of this word that's very frequent in the Gospel of John. Believe, believe, believe. Believe, that's all, that, that, that the constant uh, command to do, the exhortation, believe, you need to believe. Jesus isn't saving everyone. There are some who will perish. There are some who have been condemned already because he knows they're not going to look to him. And he tells them there, so he tells them, just as Moses lifted up the snake, so the Son of Man may be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Those who don't believe in him do not. So one needs to look to believe, to the lifted up Jesus, to be saved from death. And then D, when one looks to the Son to protect him or her from death, when a person looks to the Son for protection from death, believing he or she is not condemned. That's another big word in the Gospel of John, too, the word condemned. Uh, we see in verse uh, 15 uh, there, uh, everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Uh, we see uh, down there, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Uh, so Jesus saves from being condemned. Uh, John 5, uh, 24, uh, we looked at in our um preparing for the hearing of the word. You can see it there in your bulletin right up above where you're filling in blanks. Preparing for the hearing of the word. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. So what's the expectation for a person born on the earth? They will perish. They will be condemned. But God provides a way out. Not a bronze snake, but Jesus lifted up. And whoever looks to Jesus... Whoever looks to the lifted up Jesus, the put on a cross, the resurrected, the ascended Jesus will be saved, will not be condemned, but have eternal life. Um, so number four, number four. So know that the, the, just the uh, essential nature of looking to Jesus, and that's what saves you. And whoever doesn't look to Jesus is not saved and will perish and will be and will be condemned. But then number four, we know that's not a very popular message in our day, that people are born on the way to being condemned, that people are, are born on the way to perishing, that people are born with a proclivity to sin, not a proclivity to be, to be nice. That's not a popular message. And so Jesus gives us something here in order that we might have confidence in our faith that we might not shrink back from this message. And so this, number four, have, calm, have confidence. Have confidence in your faith, the Christian faith. And here's why Jesus says you should have confidence. Here's why he told his disciples they should have confidence. Here's why John was telling his original readers in AD 90, who were Jewish people who had believed in Jesus, who all who, whose relatives were all saying, you're crazy, you've left the Jewish faith. What have you done? And John tells them, have confidence. And here's why. Have confidence in your faith, the Christian faith, for everyone else is just guessing. This is the point Jesus brings up. Everyone else talking about eternal things is just guessing. If I start talking about the way things are in Namibia, don't know why I'm thinking of that, I am just guessing. Why? I've never been there. I can't give you an eyewitness account of how Namibia, Namibia is. Can't even pronounce it. 
Um, I can't tell you whether it's mountainous or whether it's arid. Um, I can't tell you the poverty level or the wealth level there. Can't tell you. I'm not an eyewitness. I would just be guessing. And if I started talking on and on about the way Namibia is, (laughs) I would just be guessing. But Jesus wasn't guessing when he talked about eternal things, when he talked about heavenly things. Uh, And so we say here in A, 4A, lots of people through human history have made truth claims. Lots of people through human history from the time of Adam's descendants on have made truth claims. Lots of people regarding, number one, satisfying life. Right? We just go, go to any bookstore. Truth claims. How to be satisfied in life, whether it's a business book or a sociological book or a psychology book, um, truth claims, or a religious book, Dianetics, right? Truth claims about how to have a satisfied life and how to live with satisfaction or um, what's going to happen after death. That's your second thing there, your number two. All through human history, people have made truth claims and had beliefs regarding what happens after death. And then B, these matters are heavenly things. What happens after death? You know, and even when you have uh, different like near-death experiences and people say, I saw this tunnel and this light, we don't know. You know, it's it's Charles Dickens, it's Ebenezer Scrooge when he sees uh, a Bob, not Bob Marley, not Ziggy Marley, Jacob Marley. When he sees Jacob Marley, his old dead business partner, and he asks the ghosts of Jacob Marley, how do I know it's you and not some undigested piece of beef? In other words, am I just having hallucination or am I, uh, am I, do I have indigestion and I'm hallucinating like Betsy's brother when he um, had a can of, he, he had a jar of ragu when he was at Fort Bragg as a, a newly enlisted uh, 98th, um, 82nd Airborne, and, and you know, you buy ragu at the store and it's on the shelf. But there's this, there are these little words on, on, the, on the jar that say, refrigerate after opening. <laughs> and so he put it under, he had some, and then he put it under his bunk, and then a couple of weeks later he came back to it, and he said, <laughs> <laughs> he put it in his pantry, he came back to it, and, and, and he said, oh man, somebody gave me some cheese. <laughs> and he put it on whatever he was eating, you know, this ragu with the cheese on it. And then he, he literally was hallucinating. Did he have to go to the ER? No. He was hallucinating. He, he dreamed he was seeing the, you know, the, the green little plastic army men were attacking him. <laughs> So that's a, that's the modern day equivalent of the undigested uh, uh, undigested beef, piece of beef. But everyone else is just guessing. No one's been there to tell you what heaven is like, right? They're just guessing. Um, you know, and some of the stuff that's going on today about how someone lives their lives and gender things and and who can be your your marriage spouse. That's that's guessing. We uh, where's the research on that? Have we really had generations of people that we can say, yeah, this is good for people? It's just guessing. It's theory. And that's what we have in the world about satisfying life and about eternity, what's going to happen after death. It's theory. And Jesus says, but let me tell you something. I'm not giving you theory. See what he says there in verse 11? I tell you the truth. We speak... We and my apostles, we speak of what we know. The apostles knew it because they were hearing it from an eyewitness. We speak of what we know. We testify of what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you out of earthly things. You do not believe. How then will you believe I speak of heavenly things? And then he says this, verse 13. Everyone's guessing. He, He puts it this way, verse 13. No one has ever gone into heaven to be able to tell you about what's going to happen after death, to be able to tell you from the one who's created everything, who knows what's good for your soul and your body because he made you. 
No one's been there to consult with him. How should we live? It doesn't go that direction, just someone thinking out of their head. But he says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And that's what John has established in chapter 1. Jesus is the one who came from heaven. And a huge emphasis um, in uh, the book of John, I think there are 49 or more instances of Jesus saying, the Father sent me from heaven, I've come from heaven, I'm returning to heaven. Not going there the first time, returning to heaven. It's like 49 or more times. I've got it written down in my Bible, but I won't flip through it right now here for you. That many times. And Jesus is saying, um, you have a faith, you folks sitting here right now, you have a faith given to you by the one who's not guessing. Given to you by one who was born in Namibia and has spent his whole life there and leads around as a tour guide people who come to see it. He knows all this stuff about it. And that's what the gospel is. It's the one who knows. He speaks. I tell you the truth. Verse 11. I speak of what I know and I testify to what I have seen. And so we speak derivatively of that as Christians. We speak from the one who's seen it. From the one who's seen it. So these matters are be heavenly things known, that's your be, known by the one in heaven who makes life and brings death, verse 11, and then C, no one making their claims about heavenly things has gone into heaven. No one making these claims has gone into heaven. They haven't gotten from their source, the one who designed a human person. They haven't gone to the source and said, how should we live? To get, that's your next blank there, they haven't gone into heaven to get what's true about life and death. They've simply made guesses from their own heads. That's what worldly religions are. Religions on the earth. People out of their own heads trying to figure, you know, and even like in primitive religions like human sacrifice, just out of their own heads. They say, guys, if we're honest, we deserve venomous snakes. So let's make a sacrifice. Maybe if we want to make a really good one of one of our own. Maybe one of our daughters or one of our sons. Let's make a sacrifice to appease the anger of the gods, whoever they would be. You know, Paul, when he, I went to, I think it was Athens, you know, they had a statue to an unknown god. They knew someone, someone was up there. Someone was controlling things, and in their specific instances, controlling the rain. Uh, in that city, they had prayed for rain, and it didn't come, and it didn't come, and it didn't come. They went through all the Greek gods, and nobody sent rain. And so they said, there must be an unknown god. And so they prayed to the unknown god, and it rained. And so then they made a statue that said, to an unknown god, to commemorate that. And so Paul said, there is an unknown god, and let me tell you of him. Um, I've heard from him. He spoke to me from heaven when I was traveling to Damascus one day. So have confidence in your faith. You're not, you're not in a faith. You're not in a religion that's coming out of the head of some woman or some man somewhere who just thought he figured things out. You're not in a religion like Buddhism, which not really isn't about God at all. It's about how to balance in your life so your life is good. It's a very self-centered religion there. You're not in a religion like Hinduism with you know, things that you can't show in the office because they're obscene, you know, and gods that are doing obscene things with each other. You're not in a Greek religion where they're motivated by, by, by vengeance and uh, all, all kinds of, uh, of human foibles, you know, if you learn mythology at all. Um, you're not worshiping a god that, that someone named Muhammad called Allah and then created a religion out of that. You're not in a religion such as Mormonism where the founder says, well, I was given two golden, these golden tablets and I copied everything down and then, oh, they're gone. Can't show them to you. <laughs> There's no proof and you can't find it. You just got to take me for my word. That's what we don't have, a religion coming out of someone's head, uh, a philosophy class, something we hear there, a self-help book, advice from Reddit or, or TikToks. Um, 
We don't have just what evolutionary biologists, that's what they're doing, realize that with evolution. They weren't there when life began. They're making guesses. What do we have in scripture? The one who created life telling us what he did. That's who Jesus is. The one who created life. From him, nothing has been, as John said in, in John 1, 3. Outside of him, in John 1, 5, outside of him, nothing that was made, nothing that has been made, is made or exists apart from him. Um, evolutionists are, have been making guesses, and they made guesses for so long, and then the evidence started coming in, and genetics started coming in, and chemistry started coming in, not, not supporting their theory, but they were in too far. They'd done their PhD dissertations, and that's what their career depended upon. And so they stuck with it. A theory. They weren't there. We weren't there either, but we've been given a message by the one who was. And so we can have confidence. So, D, D. Jesus came from heaven. Verse 13, verses 1 through 5 of chapter 1, as well as verse 14. Uh, number one, D1, he was in heaven before he came to the earth. John's emphatic about that. Jesus is emphatic about that. The Father has sent me. Um, and then uh, number two there, he wasn't guessing about heavenly things. You see that there in verse 12. Jesus says, I've spoken to you of earthly things. Um, probably stuff about, you know, like the, the earthly temple he'd spoken of in chapter 2, but, but different parables about, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower who goes out and sows seed, about earthly things. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you speak, believe if I speak of heavenly things? So Jesus wasn't guessing about heavenly things. Rather, here's your blank, he was reporting. He was giving eyewitness. What's it like up there? They could ask Jesus as they were with him. That was my desire as a, as a kid. I wish Jesus, not understanding the gospel, I wish Jesus hadn't died on the cross. I believed he was eternal. Didn't understand the gospel yet, but I believed he was God's son. I believed he could have lived on, and I would have loved to ask him questions like this. What's it like in heaven? And he could have told me because he had, he had been there. So he is reporting or testifying of what's, what's true. Um, he was testifying what thought and behavior makes for a satisfying life. He was testifying about what happens after death. Uh, and what he says about heavenly things is true knowledge because he's an eyewitness of it. He is true. He is true knowing. And then look at verse 18. He says there, no one has ever seen God. In other words, they're all guessers. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only. Okay, that's the same reference to verse 16. The one and only Son. God, the one and only. I, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus is at the Father's side, and he made him, he made him known uh, to us. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, is at the Father's side, has made him known. That's John's statement about Jesus in John chapter 1. So our summary, summary. If a person looks to Jesus, if a person looks to Jesus to be saved from eternal death, just like those people in the wilderness under Moses looked at that bronze snake, if a person looks to Jesus with content, what they want Jesus to do. Not, oh, I think he's a good teacher. Not, oh, I think he's a gentle man. I think he was a great man and a great spiritual leader and said things that were helpful to people. But they looked to Jesus to save them from death. Like people look to that bronze snake to save them from death. So there's a content on there. There's something riding on this. If they have that kind of faith, looking to Jesus to save them from eternal death, they will be saved from eternal death. And the condemnation that is currently holding back, um, that, that, uh, that that when it comes, when those walls are lifted, um, they will be saved. Um, so that person will be saved, that's your blank, and have eternal life. 
So if a person looks to Jesus to be saved from eternal death and the condemnation God is currently holding back, he will be saved and have eternal life. And then second thing, those who believe, you who believe in this, should be confident in your faith. Recognize the difference between the Christian faith and all other faiths. No other faith has a founder who says, I am God, I've come from heaven, and I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know. No other faith is like that. Every other faith is not this direction, it's the other direction. It's men looking up, trying to discern, trying to figure things out, and then other people saying, that sounds good to me, and then they gain confidence, and then they publish a book, <laughs> or they start speaking. But be confident. Those who believe should be confident in their faith because the facts of their faith that is the heavenly things. How you should live and what happens after death and how you escape what you deserve. The heavenly things are not guesses of people. They're not guesses of people, but the testimony of the one who came from heaven. They're the our faith, the tenets, the, the fact bits of our faith is the testimony of the one who came from heaven. That is, guess who? Jesus, Jesus. Let's pray.